I'm Bill Harmer, the Executive Director of the Westport Library. It is my distinct pleasure and one of the greatest thrills in my career to welcome you all for what promises to be an unforgettable evening with baseball legend and the new manager of the Chicago White Sox, Mr. Tony La Russa. Tony La Russa was elected unanimously into the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame in 2014 for his outstanding achievements as manager of the Chicago White Sox, Oakland Athletics, and St. Louis Cardinals, solidifying his place as one of the greatest baseball managers of all time. During his impressive career, Mr. La Russa led the Oakland A's and St. Louis Cardinals twice to World Series championships and is the third winningest manager in Major League history. He holds an absurd number of baseball records, including ranking second in total number of games managed, and is one of only two managers to win a World Series in both the National and American Leagues. The only other manager to accomplish that feat is Sparky Anderson. After leading the St. Louis Cardinals to win the 2011 World Series, he took a break from his managerial career. He served as Chief Baseball Officer for the Arizona Diamondbacks, Vice President and Special Assistant to the President of Baseball Operations for the Boston Red Sox, and Senior Advisor for Baseball Operations for the Los Angeles Angels. In 2020, in October, it was announced that Tony would be returning to the dugout to manage the Chicago White Sox 34 years after last wearing the White Sox uniform. Amidst his baseball priorities, Tony also retains and is passionate about his duties as chairman of the board at the Animal Rescue Foundation, which is an award-winning nationally recognized leader for its unique mission of people rescuing animals and animals rescuing people. Tonight, Tony LaRusso will be in conversation with Steve Parrish, a longtime resident of Westport, staunch supporter of the Westport Library, and the founder of Steve Parrish Consulting Group, LLC, specializing in crisis management, corporate social responsibility, public affairs and communications for senior executives, law firms, and nonprofit organizations. Prior to founding SPCG, Steve was Senior Vice President, Corporate Affairs of Altria Group, serving in that capacity from 1995 until his retirement in 2008. At Altria, he chaired the company's crisis management team and served as Secretary of the Public Affairs and Social Responsibility Committee of the Board of Directors. For more than a decade, Steve actively supported proposals to grant the Federal Food and Drug Administration authority to regulate the tobacco industry. He has appeared on numerous national news programs such as Face the Nation, Meet the Press, Nightline, The News Hour on PBS, The Today Show, and the CBS Morning News. And now I am thrilled to turn the virtual podium over to Steve to get the conversation started with our most esteemed and accomplished guest, Mr. Tony La Russa. Thank you. Number one, what is your name, please? My name is Tony La Russa. Number two. My name is Tony La Russa. And number three. My name is Tony La Russa. Only one of these people is the real Tony La Russa and has sworn to tell the truth. <laughs> Thanks for that, Bill. Thanks, Tony, for being here. My name is Steve Parrish, and we have with us tonight uh, the one and only Tony LaRussa. Um, Bill gave a really nice overview, Tony, of some of your awards and honors, so I'm not going to repeat that, but uh, let, I want to start real quickly with an overview of your career as a player in the major leagues. And I'll start with a quote. And I got this from uh, the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame website uh, about you. And it's, and it's a quote attributed to you. And it says, Tony the manager would have really liked and respected Tony the player, except he never would have played him because Tony the manager was trying to win. <laughs> so with that introduction in your own words, tell us a little bit about your career. I know you signed right <clears throat> high school with the Kansas City Athletics uh, at the age of what, about 18, 17? 17. And um, which leads me to a, a baseball trivia question. Uh, in the history of Major League Baseball, there have been 
three players who have started a game at shortstop at the age of 18. Two of them I know, Robin Yao and Alex Rodriguez. I'm gonna let you tell everybody who the third was. Well, the, the correct answer is that two pearls and a turd, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm the turd. <laughs> so uh, actually I was the first one because it was in 1963. <clears throat> Just um, the usually the least said about my playing career the happier I am, but uh, I was in uniform for 16 years. Uh, grew up in Tampa, Florida when I was about five or six. Uh, fell in love with the game. My father, my uncles uh, just immersed me in it. Uh, in those days, there was no draft. So literally the night that I graduated from high school, uh, when I went home, the teams that were interested were there to make an offer. Uh, a bit of history. Uh, this was the era where uh, Charles Finley, Charlie O, was the owner of the Kansas City A's, and he had gained some uh, and ended up with some uh, notoriety because he personally would visit what his scouts said were the, high, not the hot prospects. So uh, most famously, Catfish Hunter, uh, Blue Moon Odom, uh, and he came to visit me, and later on they were stars, and he always said I was his only mistake. <laughs> and then I became a manager. So maybe you're a manager. And I didn't know it. But uh, in those days, if you signed, uh, which I signed for a bonus uh, and it, it included a college scholarship plan, the next year they had to protect you. So guys like Sandy Koufax, for example, uh, he was at, he got in the big leagues because they had to keep him. Uh, so I was 18 years old. And uh, so I was the first one I played. I got 44 bats, 1144. Uh, the mistake I made was I should have gone to college because I was kind of a skinny kid. And uh, five of the first six years I played, things got broken. I tore my uh, tendon in my throwing arm, which really restricted me the rest of my career. But instead of being a good arm at shortstop, I had to be a kind of underhand flipper at second. Uh, dislocated my shoulder, diving for balls, got hit on a double play, tore up my knee, got hurt my back. So the only reason I point that out was but I played 10 more years and, and I, I was sore, but I never really had another injury to get through that and continue to play. It solidified what I knew, which is I loved baseball and uh, was going to hang on as long as I could. Uh, I did enough to sit the bench in the big leagues four years on and off with the Oakland A's. Uh, the last three years uh, I was a player coach and that was important because that's where the uh, love of the game and a chance to stay around as a manager uh, really hit. But uh, lifetime bang average, 198, 199, which is, you know, the least said the better. And it wasn't anything. My two highlights were all just partial appearances in, in, in the, the opening day of a, of a season. So I was doing very good. So Tony, you, you spent some time with the Atlanta Braves and for a time we're a teammate of Hank Aaron, who uh, a great man, as well as a great baseball player we lost uh, this week. Um, tell us a little bit about Hank, cause I knew you knew him. Well, this is uh, from the Oakland A's became the Oakland A's in 1968. Before that they're Kansas City A's. So from 68, 69, 70, 71, I, I made uh, brief appearances in the big leagues. In 1971, Dick Williams took over the team. I made the club in spring training. During the season, uh, they needed a pitcher. A guy named Jim Mudcat Grant came on the route, and they traded me to the Braves. So for the last six weeks, I had one of the great breaks of my career because uh, I watched Tank Aaron for six weeks and realized just how uh, – not worthy I was and could never play at anything like that level. But more importantly, um, there are a lot of nights on plane trips when guys would be sleeping and I'd be walking around and stand with, I mean, Hank would ask me to sit next to him just to talk. And just the most gracious, beautiful personality, which he retained his entire career. In fact, I believe he's, uh, you know, he's like a Stan usual people like that. You know, the, probably he may be the finest man I, I ever I have ever met in a game of baseball. So when you think about his career professionally to make that statement personally, 
shows you how to, it was just a lucky break. And thereafter, you know, when I was a man, he stopped by and, you know, and treated me like, uh, like I belonged. So you mentioned that you were a player coach. Um, at what point um, in your playing career, if that's when it happened, did you start to entertain dreams of managing in the big league? Um, it wasn't to the player coach, Steve, because the first 13 years, uh, you know, I was, a, I, was, I was a good AAA player, hit 300 sometimes, a couple all-star teams. And, you know, I would get this brief hit. But I had this, you know, this going on. In those days, my sort of tendon was pushing his brain. We're losing a little bit of your audio, Tony. Uh, how about now? There you go. All right. So, uh, for the first 13 years, I was trying to be a player, and then I had to realize, you know, infielder with a with a sore throwing arm, I wasn't going to make it. That's when I thought about going to law school to uh, have a, a profession I could fall back on. So that took me five five uh, winters. The last three, I stayed playing ball because I was earning decent money in AAA. The last three years, a player coach. That's really, uh, I played my first two years in the White Sox AAA team. And the manager's guy, Lauren Babe. Uh, and he was perfect because he knew I loved the game. And he could, I could ask him anything I wanted to anytime. He said, I won't take it as a second guess. So for two years with Lauren, uh, he showed me what it is to manage, you know, the, the whole spectrum of managing not just the game decisions. And uh, Lane and I were married without the kids. And when I graduated from law school, I just played my last year. And, and uh, we said, look, you know, why don't I get this, you know, why don't I see if I can manage for a year and get it out of my system. And then uh, I started catching every break in the world. But it wasn't until I started playing coaching. Thank, thanks, Tony. I, it sounds like there's something covering up your microphone. So I don't know. I don't know if you if something's obstructing it. But anyway, so I want to talk a little bit about managing. So you start managing in the minor leagues. Uh, obviously, there was a point in time where you uh, had to manage your first game uh, as a professional manager, this time in the minor leagues. And you've told me the story about that game. And I'd love for you to repeat it for everybody. Well, it's it's one that uh, it's one of those deals where you laugh about it later. We've always heard that saying. So, you know, here again, you know, I played, loved the game, and now uh, after law school graduation, I got the chance to manage the Double A club for the White Sox. Uh, if there's any uh, old timers listening to this and they recognize the name Paul Richards who was 70 years old in 1978 uh, when I started managing. Um, he was really a guru of pitching. And uh, he had given all his young managers his pointers. And one of them was as you make your money and your value by handling the bullpen. And he gave us three or four really golden tips, which I still followed to this day. One of them was that the really good managers, they stay ahead of the problem. When they see that something's about to happen, like a pitcher's losing his stuff, you know, have the guts to make the move before the damage. So sure enough, it's my first game of double-A playing in Chattanooga. We got a one-run lead, uh, bottom of the ninth inning, and I'm nervous as a cat, man. We're three outs away from winning. And sure enough, uh, the pitcher, a guy named Freddie Howard, was on the mound. And he had pitched a couple of innings. That was before the true closer. And and uh, I noticed his fastball lost a lot of little zip. His breaking ball, instead of being snapping off, was kind of rolling. A couple of guys get on base, second and third with two outs. And I'm thinking, man, this is he's not the same pitcher. This is Paul's thing. Uh, he, he's really vulnerable. So I'm going to make the move ahead of the damage. So I walk out, bring in the reliever. He gives a single, we lose. So now I walk in the locker room, you know, the double A locker room in Chattanooga and I'm, I'm beside myself. You got my head between my legs, just, you know, just what? Well, I was so upset, but mostly I was wondering what did Mr. Richards, who was at the game, what did he think about the decision? So he walks in, he's, he called me boy, he's from Texas. 
Boy, yes, sir, Mr. Richards. After watching that decision, you may have better been, you know, I'm, I, I'm trying to shorten it up, but there is an old saying that the worst players make the best managers. And he had introduced me that afternoon to the uh, Chamber of Commerce luncheon as if you think the worst players make the best managers, this young man's got a chance to be an outstanding manager. And everybody laughed because, they're, you know, hey, he's a bad player, great manager. The punchline is when he walked in, he says, you may have been a better player than I thought you were. In other words, lousy decision. <laughs> so you obviously overcame first uh, first game as a Man League manager, and you get uh, called up, as I recall, in the middle of the season to manage the Chicago White Sox. Coach, the fir coach first base. Oh, you're coaching first base, and then you became the manager in midseason, right? The next year. How did that come about? Uh, well, I, I, I think it's important to mention that in 78, we were so good at double A and Bob Lemon was a man, major league manager and he got fired and Bill Vec hired the first black African-American to manage in the American league, which is Larry Doby, who was the first African-American to play in the American league. And they wanted some youth at first base. So they brought me up from double A coach first base. So at the end of the season, they let him go, and Don Kessinger was the manager, and uh, I went to AAA. Uh, they had a rough season in August. Uh, get a call, and they were letting Kessinger go. And I really believe that the only reason I got called up with parts of two years' experience and one year in winter ball was I had that law degree, and you know, Bill was, was kind of a maverick, and. Uh, I think he said, hey, this guy's got a law degree, why not? And that's how I got a chance to manage. And uh, believe me, I was hanging on by my, uh, by the edge of my fingers there on the edge of the cliff. And uh, 33 years later, I, I was still there. So you, you take over the White Sox. Uh, I think what you finished that year, what, at 500? Yeah, it was 54 games, 27-27. And then the next year, am I right? You went to the playoffs. No, that's just, no, you just, I two wish. Seasons. No, the, the next year was my first full year. It was Bill Vex last year. And uh, no, we were uh, 70 and 90. Now the general manager said that may have been my best manager because we were really a bad club. I think it's trying to make me feel good. Then what happened was Bill sold the club to Jerry Reinstorf. So that was 81. Uh, and 81 was the year of the strike. So that was curtailed. 82 got to the end. We made a substantial improvement. 83, we won 99 games and won the West. And did you win manager of the year? That was my first manager of the year. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, so things go along, are going pretty well with the White Sox, but at some point, um, you part ways with the White Sox. I think Jerry Reinsdorf told me it was the worst mistake he's ever made in his life was letting the general manager, Ken Harrelson, I think, uh, let you go. And you very quickly are signed by the Oakland A's. And that began uh, a legendary run with the A's. Tell us a little bit about the personalities on that team and what <laughs> it was like to manage those guys. Well, I'm gonna back up a strike because I think it's really important. Um, 83, uh, we won 99. In those days, if you can imagine, best of five to go to the World Series. So we played Baltimore, the great Baltimore Orioles. Cal Ripken was in his second year, um, and they beat us. Um, the next year, Tom Seaver joined us. So I can't, I, I need to explain to, to everybody listening what a humongous break that was for me personally. Tom Seaver was with us for two years, uh, 84 and 85, part of 86 when I got fired. Brilliant, brilliant pitcher, brilliant baseball mind. He really helped my uh, my managing and the way I handled pitchers. So I didn't want to forget that. So I get fired, go over to Oakland, and I walk into uh, best situation you can find. Uh, Eighty six, the, the uh, rookie of the year was going to be Jose Oquendo, uh, Jose Canseco. Eighty seven was McGuire. Eighty eight Walt Weiss. So he had this very productive. A minor league system, really outstanding 
a guy named Carl Keo, Keith Lippman, who's still there. And they had some really good veterans. Dave Stewart was on the roster in 86. And, you know, of course, at some point we're going to talk about uh, but the, our coaching staff over the years. Well, Dave Duncan made him a, a starting pitcher, and Dave Stewart won 20 games in a row for four straight years. So part of what you asked, um, there were a lot of dynamic personalities. <clears throat> you know, in the outfield, we had Jose in right field who, as he got more successful, fancied himself more a performer than a player. And we had Dave Henderson in center field. And if you remember Dave, always had a smile on his face, signed autographs, having fun, except that he was a dead game competitor. I mean, he's, he knew that we were keeping score. And the left field was Ricky Henderson, if you can imagine, from the middle of 89 to the end. So Dave Henderson would yell at both of them. He, you know, Ricky would be out there messing around with the fans and he'd yell at him, pay attention. And Jose was looking in the mirror, trying to check himself out. And he'd have to, so those are three. We got two DHs in 88. One of them was the great Don Baylor in his last year. One of the, one of the real winning players, tough competitors. And also an amazing man named ba Dave Parker, who I really think, you know, is a hall of famer and hasn't been voted in, but uh, Dave's got a giant person. I remember from the Pirates went to Cincinnati, but he was the kind of guy, quick-witted, you know, he, when those young bucks like Conseco and McGuire would start to get a little uh, full of themselves, he would remind them that they, had, that they weren't anywhere near him because he would lead the league in hit and lead it in RBIs and home runs and do it with a smile. And then we had the, uh, the great infield with Carney and Weiss, Gallego, Mark McGuire first. I mean, believe me, it's an embarrassment of riches. And our pitching staff, we had Dave Stewart, had Bob Welsh, who won 27 games one year. And the, the closer was Dennis Eckersley. So I think the folks are listening to this, to our program tonight. Uh, our strategy, as explained by the players, for me, tell us what time the game starts and who we're playing and get out of the way. <laughs> and we'll score enough runs to where you can't mess it up. So one of the questions that we uh, had emailed in before the, the evening was about Jose Canseco. And the question was during his 40-40 season, 40 stolen bases and 40 home runs, did he have, uh, was he able to steal whenever he wanted or did he have to get the sign? No, I thought uh, the only guy, there were very few guys, you had to really have a good idea of, how to be a successful stolen base guy. In other words, success is me measured more by your percentage of success versus caught stealing. That a lot of guys will go out there and steal 30 bases and get thrown out 30 times. Well, that's not helpful. And Jose would have a tendency to want to just pile up stats. So uh, we had three signs if you got to first base. One was red light, can't go. Another was green light, which is uh, if you like a pitch, and you feel like you can get a good jump, you've got a green light. And very often, <clears throat> we had another one, which was to watch the bench. And uh, and I would give the sign from the bench kind of surreptitiously by the way I was standing or something that it's okay to run if you get a jump. Uh, a, I would say of the 40 steals, half of them, you know, we picked a pitch for them because we really studied, you know, when the guy might throw a breaking ball and stuff like that. But uh, at that time, by the way, uh, Jose, this is before the 1990 five year contract for five million bucks a year. And he was really a good player. And even though he went to high school and uh, very intelligent about the game of baseball, uh, he, he ran the bases. I think 16 or 17 of his 40 home runs came with a two strikes because we had a two strike approach. So uh, that was Jose at his best. And then as a young guy, when he, once he got that all that money, he started losing his way. Yeah. So you have a lot of success in Oakland, but um, that period that that job comes to an end. Well, and Steve, very... Steve, I got to interrupt. Sure. Because I'm haunted by I don't say a lot of success. I say we had some success. We got in three World Series. And I felt we had the best team we won one time. 
And I do believe, you know, I mean, my dad always said, you might fool other people, don't fool yourself. And I really felt that uh, the 90 series, we got swept by Cincinnati. Uh, I didn't do a good job of getting them ready. 88, you know, Gibson and, and Hershiser, that, that's a little bit more explainable. So I can't let you get away with the had a lot of success because we should have had more success if I had managed better. I, I take your point. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I believe that Walt Jockety had been the general manager in Oakland. Uh, assistant general manager. Assistant general manager. Then he ended up in St. Louis, right? Yes. So when you left, uh, when it came time for you to leave Oakland, Walt brought you to St. Louis. And you made the jump between the American League and the National League to, in my opinion, as a uh, originally a Missourian, one of the great sports franchises in sports, the St. Louis Cardinals. Um, was that a tough decision to jump leagues and uh, go to this storied uh, baseball franchise in this storied baseball town? Yes or no? Yes, because. Oh, you're muffled again, Tony. Uh, I'm Sorry, how about now? That's great. Better? That's great. Yeah, great. Uh, yes or no, because I say yes, tough. When you have 16 years of American League expertise, that's a heck of an advantage. And going into the National League where you start fresh, um, if there was a really good situation, I probably would have stayed in the American League. Uh, but, uh, and he was mentioned earlier, uh, Sparky Anderson, uh, the other, the other uh, manager won a World Series of both leagues. One of the great mentors of all young guys that walked into the league as managers. Sparky told me, I know you love the game. Before you quit, be sure you manage the National League with the pitcher in the game because there's so much more to do strategy-wise. Uh, so even though I, my, I hesitated, uh, Walt Jackie, I knew him not just from Oakland, but he was a, a business manager in, in AAA. Um, chance to manage that historic franchise because I remember I had, as a fan, I had gone 82, five and seven World Series. And I had observed when you walk around the streets, just, just the excitement of the fans. And, uh, and I knew that they were second to the Yankees with Pennant. So I was really, uh, I just embraced the history and the culture. And it's, you know, one of the biggest breaks that I received as a manager because it's an honor to be there for 16 years. So you touched on this briefly, Tony, but if you can't go into a little bit more detail about the difference between managing American League versus National League. The biggest difference is the pitchers in the lineup. Um, and because he's in the lineup, uh, you know, that extra bat, that, which is a DH in the American League, uh, well, if you have anything like a reasonable offense in American League to good, when you every time you take the field defensively, you have a chance to give up some runs. In the Amer in the National League, those opportunities where the pitcher comes to bat, especially the first half of the game before they might pinch hit, it's you know you you can you can get a zero a lot easier. Well, in the American League, you generally are looking for crooked numbers because runs are hard easier to come by, and the small game, the small ball game, is not as pronounced. Now, that wasn't true because in the Oakland ballpark at night, the ball didn't carry. So we really featured them, even with all our power. We won a lot of games with hitting runs and stolen bases. But in the National League, quite often, and the way that this great uh, coach with the St. Louis Cardinals, the great George Kissel, the way he explained it, in the National League, when you do your preparation in spring training, prepare your team as the highest priority when you're tied, you got to find a way to make one stinking run. And if you're winning by a run, you got to find a way to prevent one stinking run. If you think about that, that goes into how you pitch, how you defend, you know, the intelligence of making routine plays. And on offense, it means most of the time you get a rally started, how you get them around in a scoring position, how you get them home. And that's different. Uh, use the bench more. Uh, I think 
you know, the casual fan that loves a lot of offense probably likes the American League. The true baseball fan that loves, loves the, the, all the little nuances, the National League is more entertaining. So you, you mentioned spring training. Um, you, as I understand it, are, if not unique, unusual in that you personally plan each and every day of spring training, whereas some managers or most managers turn that over to somebody else, uh, such as the bench coach, to plan that out. What's, what's your thinking behind that? Well, it started in, <clears throat> excuse me, with survival. Um, the last year <clears throat> as a minor league manager was 79, I was AAA manager. And Paul Richards asked or demanded that I be part of organizing the spring training camp for the entire minor leagues. When I got the job at the end of the year, a uh, great baseball man, the famous baseball man, Bobby Winkles, Arizona State uh, coach, Coach Reggie and Sal and Rick Mundy. He was a third base coach. And the spring of 79, when I was a AAA manager, I watched what Bobby did to put that camp together. And it was really, really well done, very organized. So as we, and when I got rehired for 80, Paul Richards called me. He says, what are you doing about spring training? And I right away, I said, well, Bobby Winkles, he did a great job. He, so he asked me two questions. He asked me, well, if it's a good camp, who's going to get the credit? I said, Bobby, of course. He says, well, um, he asked uh, what, uh, like a complimentary question. He says, what well, do you think that, that you've got the respect of all the players? I said, no, not yet. He says, well, there's another one. Then if it's a bad camp, who's going to get the blame? I said, me. And then I know what you're saying. You know, it's, it's, it's my butt, you know, take charge. And uh, I really enjoyed it. Now, just to make sure everybody understands, you know, I don't sit in a room by myself and, and figure out what the infield defense, outfield, all the little, you know, you associate, you, you bring in the coaches, you ask the infield coach what drills, you know, we talk about the drills, outfield pitching coach, hitting drill, and then you just, but the, the framework of the, of, the, uh, of the action, the rotation through the different stations, I did it all those years and I'm doing it this year for, for the White Sox and um, people find that hard to believe, but you really get a feel of where guys are and, and what are the priorities that you have to keep working on. And you make an impression with the players that, and this is one of the things, no matter how good your coaches are, it's very important that the manager be seen in every phase of the game. Uh, players have to know that you're not ignoring them. So I want to come back in a minute to the White Sox, um, the 2021 White Sox. But I want to ask you a couple other things about spring training. Um, at least with the Cardinals, I'm not sure about the A's and the, the earlier time with the White Sox. But when you were with the Cardinals, you made a point every spring training of bringing some of the legendary players from the Cardinal franchise back down to spring training, put them in uniform and have them spend time with the players. What was the thinking behind that? Well, it, it was something that uh, the organization really enjoyed doing it. I mean, you mentioned the great uh, connection between the St. Louis Cardinals on the field as an organization and the fans. And they have this amazing tradition. All their great players are great people. So the organization wanted to have them be a part during the season. They employed them to come by the ballpark. Well, if you bring them to spring training, uh, you, there's two effects. One of them, a lot of fans come to, you know, St. Petersburg, Jupiter. But the other one is there was such a tradition, and uh, I think the folks would enjoy. When I first got there, legendary uh, broadcaster Jack Buck and Mike Shannon pulled me aside, spring of 96, and they wanted to make sure that I understood the responsibility that I had as a manager of that franchise. And it had to do with the great years in you know, the 30s, the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, of history of, of winning, 
of playing the game correctly. Well, I was, I was inundated with the responsibility that, you know, we just had to keep carrying the flag. So I really felt that with those guys in camp and they were, I mean, just great people. You think about it, Bob Gibson, Lou Brock, Sam Musial, Reg Sandings, you know, when they're walking around and credibility was just all over the place. And also they, nobody wanted to let them down because if, you know, if you did something stupid in a nice way, they'd look at you and say, Hey, are you trying to gamblers get to you? What the hell? This is not how we play. So they were really like team leaders, even though they weren't on the team and, uh, and everybody really enjoyed them. And uh, it's just, uh, I think, you know, I think more and more teams do it because you know, it's one of my pet peeves, you know, a lot of kids, you know, you can ask them who Johnny Carson is. They don't know who Johnny Carson. I mean, history is just whether it's American history or world history or even pop culture. You know, it's what happened lately, uh, and, and you need to keep resurrecting the history so that you can really take understand the importance of what's happening currently. Which brings me to another question I wanted to ask you about spring training. Um, you would bring in, I think, usually toward the end of the spring training camp, uh, a non-baseball person, a, a well-known leader, an accomplished leader, and have that person address the team. One year I was there, it was Louis Zamperini uh, who, who was there. What was behind that? Well, a couple of things, and it was, it, it really happened all spring. Uh, one of the beauties, it really was, it really started when we went to Jupiter, which was uh, my second year. For, so 14 years, of course, that's when I met you with uh, Philip Morris Invitational. But in the Jupiter area, there are a lot of uh, sports legends that make their winter home, spring home there. And a lot of people will come and, and uh, come down for a vacation. So you know, when you're, when you're with a team, like I was 16 years, you always worry about your message getting stale. And you felt like, I felt like if somebody came in and talked to the team, they would say pretty, you know, some of the basics, how you get a team ready and, 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 and how you compete and all that stuff, you know, it's, but when somebody says the same thing differently, it's more entertaining. So, I mean, Jack Nicholas, who lived down he Jack Nicholas was there. Mike Ruzioni, a miracle on ice. I, I saw him at a restaurant one time. I said, Mike, what are you doing tomorrow? You know, I'm playing golf at 9 30. I said, Can you come by at eight? Talk to our team. But you know, John Havlicek, you know, although Bob, I, I never met Bob Cousy, but he lived there. But Bill Belichick, Bill Parcells, you know, Bob Knight would visit. And uh, you know, um, General Moore. Uh, so they could be business leaders, military leaders, sports leaders. And invariably, it was such a great connection because uh, our guys treated those guys with the respect they deserve. So they enjoyed coming over and we enjoyed their, uh, their messages. And, and like I say, to repeat it, if you, can, if you can say the same thing different ways and by different people, it has a fresh impact. I want to switch gears a little bit. We're talking about uh, important things you did to lead the, the Cardinals. Your managerial philosophy that you developed over the years, um, I think you've described it as personalization or personalizing. Explain to us what you mean by that. Well, essentially, um, if you're the manager of the baseball team, for example, your number one responsibility is not game decisions. It's not setting your rotation. Those are boxes you're supposed to check. Your number one responsibility is leadership. It's getting players. And this is probably the biggest difference from when I, you know, back when I signed and played 1963 to when I started managing in the big league in 79 August. The evolution of, of free agency, guaranteed money, um, a lot of publicity, you know, a lot of media. There were potential distractions 
Uh, a lot of agents, family, and friends would tell the players, hey, forget you, it's a team game. Go get yours. Get your numbers so you can make your money. So the first responsibility, and any coach will tell you, especially in professional sports, of, of that generation, like, you know, like 80 till now, you had to get the player's attention. You had to get them to buy into the team concept, and it had to be part of your leadership style. And the way that we did that as a staff was we stressed personalization. And we each had to take uh, our responsibility, our accountability for earning the respect and trust of our teammates, staff members, manager, player to player. So what happens is what you want to do if you do it right, and I'm pleased to say it's probably the, it in the, it in the, the, the wins and the championships, the relationships, the culture, the brotherhood, the family, relationships that we built on those teams every year uh, where everybody became accountable. That was the foundation of our success. Cause once you do that, then you start talking about how you're going to play the game. And I, I see a mistake made quite often. Coaches are really smart, but they don't understand that you got to win that frame of mind first. Another La Russa turn of the phrase that I wanted to ask you about was um, observational analytics. <laughs> well, uh, that's probably the hottest topic since 2000 to now, which is like 20 years. The hottest topic um, with its pluses and its many minuses is how you balance the metrics, the, the analytical information. There is a wealth of it around. And interestingly enough, uh, when it first, you know, like around 2000 is when clubs really started hiring metrics departments and they had their, you know, these algorithms and these formulas. And since then they've exploded. There's, it's all over the place. Well, the general perception was that all of us traditionalists, scouts, coaches, player development, front office guys, they were going to give the Heisman to the metrics guys. And the opposite has been true. You know, if you've been in the game, you're always, if you're a scout, you're looking for information, coach, manager. So we looked at the information that they brought in and, and, and wanted to embrace it. And they're the ones that generally, not everybody, have, have given the, the lack of respect or the Heisman to the traditionalists because you just, you don't understand the value of these percentages. So to me, uh, and I've been very vocal about it, um, all the, the percentages, all the information that you get is outstanding as you prepare for the competition. But once the competition starts, these are men, not machines, and you cannot make your decision based on percentages, it's too dynamic. So you really have to use observational analytics you have to look that particular day. How's this guy throwing? How's this guy swinging? Is the wind blowing in or out? Uh, you know, our famous friend, uh, Coach Belichick, last time he won the Super Bowl at the press conference, where, you know, he's famous for uh, enjoying those so much. Uh, the writer said, well, Coach, how much did the analytics play a part in your Super Bowl championship? He has to for me, he said, well, not much at all. And the reason is that he says, we use, we use the information, but once the game starts, you know, if you observe, you can see who can, the guy can rush the passer or cornerback can't defend, right? I can, I can watch the game and see that this guy's fastball isn't what we thought it was. So the most important part, once the game starts, is what you observe, and then you connect your head, your heart, and your guts uh, to your decision-making and the way our guys play. Okay, I want to shift gears on you for a minute, Tony. Um, we started off with to tell the truth. Um, so uh, we're going to play a little game of rapid fire. I'm going to throw out uh, a few names of some players that you've managed and get your quick reaction uh, to, to them. Some of them, some of their names you've mentioned, some not. Ricky Henderson. Uh, during our generation, the most dangerous player offensive player in baseball, 10 years managed against him. One run lead, he's a guy who could do the most damage to get that one run, home run, base hit, triple, steal bases. 
very misunderstood and important. The press really beat them up. Uh, they, they, if you didn't win, it's because Ricky wasn't good enough. And uh, that misunderstanding uh, was unfortunate because he's one of the most popular teammates on any team he's ever played. He doesn't play the superstar role and he's very intelligent. Tom Seaver. Brilliant. Brilliant Tom. Oh my gosh. Just, uh, you know, he was, uh, he was just a, you know, a decent arm in USC, but then he got a little stronger and he really understood his mechanics, you know, pitching with his bottom half, but his, intelligence about the competition and, and we could we could have a separate session someday and it would be very entertaining for everybody i could give you 10 things that in our two years together he taught me that became part of you know how i managed which was you know oakland and st louis after that but uh, i'll give you one he led me right into it he says uh he would always come you know john mcgraw is ahead of me for for wins and he, he called me mcgraw he says, McGraw, uh, is every, every out in the game is important, isn't it? Oh, yeah, sure, Tom. Ah, oh, you dummy. No, they're not. I, I walk right into it. He says, if you pay attention, do you pay attention? Yeah, Tom, I tried to. Well, evidently not because you wouldn't have answered as you did. Okay, Tom, what's the answer? He says, watch the game, and there are some outs that are more important than others. And the point is that when you get one of those key outs, you have to recognize it and make sure that you have every facility that you got trying to win that out. And if you watch the game, I'll give you a great example. You're winning, um, winning by four runs. It's the seventh inning, second and third, two outs. That's a key out. You get that guy out, you go to the eighth inning with four run lead. That guy gets a base hit. It's a two run game. You know what I mean? So he was full of that stuff and uh, just really a brilliant guy. Great, you know, a great sense of humor. Just loved it. You know, like when I got inducted in the Hall of Fame, you know, and I was the first to admit, great owner, great general manager, great players. He says, you know what you are, aren't you? And I said, what, Tom? In front of everybody, he says, you're a coattail Hall of Famer. Because I was in the coattail of players, general manager. And I said, hey, I, I don't disagree, but I love him. <laughs> Miss him. Dave Stewart, you mentioned Dave a little earlier, but a little bit more about Dave. If Dave had been a starter younger, he'd be a Hall of Famer. Imagine he won 24 years in a row, but he didn't become a starter until his you know, late 20s. But one of the great competitors um, had this stare that terrorized him. He just looked like Bob Gibson was. You know, Bob Gibson was nasty. Very, I don't know if you're going to ask about him, Bob Gibson brilliant man, great person, very smart, great competitor, scared the hell out of the guys. <laughs> Stu had that same look, and but you had to get, Bob's fire was always burning from the first pitch. If you looked at him sideways, he'd get upset at you. Stu was just competing, but if you ever got him going now, then he'd have that same kind of toughness, but a true number one pitcher, number one means you stand up there, opening day, first game of the playoffs, get on my back. And I'm gonna I'm gonna compete and help you win. That's Dave. At your Hall of Fame um, induction, your remarks to the crowd. You told a story about Dave Stewart one time when you went out to take him out uh, relatively early in the game. He was getting hit pretty hard. Well, you know, I, earlier today, you know, this is the best part of my life. I keep connecting with guys. There's another guy that uh, was just like that. His name is Chris Carpenter with the Cardinals. I just talked to him today, but uh, you know, when this guy, when these number one pitchers, when they go, it's their game. They want to be out there till it's decided because they know they got a better chance to help you win than anybody. And when you go out to get them, uh, you, you really, it's like pulling teeth. That's why Paul Richards would always say, as soon as you leave the dugout, make the move. Don't let them talk you out of it. Well, this particular game, well, you know, they're all human. They're men, not machines. This particular game, it's like three or four innings, and every time there's a ball hit, it's in the gap. And, you know, fan, all the folks will, you know, that's the, the re, relay, the outfielders converge on the ball in the, between in left center, right center. One of them picks it up, throws to the relay man, throw it in there, and the guy's got a double and there may be a triple. Cut off some relays, we call them, you know. So for the first four innings, every time 
And, you know, when a guy is great, he may start off slow and he gets a fix. You usually stay longer with your best guy. So it's in the fourth inning and, and you know, and they, but they got six runs on the board. And there's another ball in the gap. So it was in Oakland, which is the third base dugout. Ball goes to right center and Stu's got his back to me. And I go, you know, I'm walking up to get him. And I've already motioned. He's not happy. And he turns around. He, what are you doing here? I said, what do you mean? Well, what do you want? What are you, what are you doing here? Well, I'll come to get you. He says, why? I'm not tired. I said, yeah, but our outfielders are. <laughs> All right. Next name, Albert Pujols. Albert P. Pujols. And the P stands for perfect. He, he, you know, his rookie year, the best first 11 years in the history of baseball. Uh, average home runs, RBIs. Every year, he was more determined, more humble. Money made no difference to him. He was a great competitor. I think a lot of it has to do with his faith. Just was never going to let his faith down. Uh, was really insulted when people claimed that he had steroids because he doesn't drink or smoke. But he did everything to win the game, Steve. Uh, and one of the best examples, he could be 0 for 4. And it'd be a one-run game, and he'd be on that top step being a cheerleader. Uh, and then off the field, uh, there have been a lot of players that, get, that help. But Albert's exploits and the way with his foundation. Uh, I was with him last year after all his years with the Angels. And his greatness is uh, every year he's greater than the year before. There's a name that a lot of people may either not know or have forgotten about uh, who you coached in St. Louis, David Eckstein. <laughs> uh, David Eckstein, toughest, toughest player I've ever been around. Been around some tough ones. I mean, David is, you know, he's like not tiny, but he's like five, six. He's thin, but you can't scare him. You can't intimidate him. I've seen guys slide into him, knock him into center field. He gets right back up. I've seen guys pitchers drill him um he uh his talents you know he's got a decent arm decent speed you know decent hitter he's a lifetime 270 hitter he's a world champion twice because he's so mentally tough he's got the heart of a lion so he played with us and uh, for a couple of years he was mvp of the 06 championship and ever since my last what six years we always referred to toughness as, are you David Eckstein tough? And uh, he's coaching now with the, with the Pirates. Uh, would love to have him join me back again. He's just a beautiful guy who you could not scare. All right, new game. Name the player you would want. Number one, name the player you would want to pitch game seven, World Series on the road. Well, uh, I would say, and that's the way I would answer the question. Out of respect for you, I'm going to answer like you asked. But if you were a member of the media, I would say, because I don't want to disrespect some of the great guys that, that I've been around. So I would say they're, I'm a, these are the guys that are in the conversation. And any one of those could, could pick. It could be Dave Stewart. It could, you know, it could be Tom Seaver, even late in his career. But the great Dave Duncan, as you know, a pitching coach, 29 years together, greatest pitching coach in the history of the game. He answered that question one time. We were together all those years, and he would pick Chris Carpenter. Uh, here again, I would hesitate. Chris is a great choice, but you know, you got Adam Wainwright, you got Bob Welsh, you got Dave Stewart. Uh, it, it's tough to pick one guy. All right, new game. Name the players who would be in the conversation <laughs> for uh, who you would want at bat, bottom of the ninth, tie score, World Series. Well, there I give you the one answer, and that's Albert. Just because Albert was such a consummate winning player and was so intelligent. He'd be like, he's Tom Seaver smart as a player. He, you know, we all, you always teach guys to play the scoreboard. In other words, if you go up first, and it's a close game. You know, you're going to try and get on base, get everybody started. The guys on base, you know, how do you get them around or get them in? Albert always played the scoreboard. So in that situation, if we needed an extra base hit, he'd try to hit the ball in the gap. 
if you need a lousy single to the opposite field, he just flipped one out there. Uh, and he had the kind of talent and the intelligence and, and the stroke where he could win a game with a lousy single or an extra base hit and sometimes a home run. So um, you talked about um, your going to law school, got your law degree, you're a member of the, Cal of the Florida Bar. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things and lead into my last topic because we're starting to run short on time. Uh, a few things that people may not know about you. You're bilingual, which I think has been a plus in terms of your personalization strategy and your ability to develop, to develop relationships with, with players. You're a vegetarian and you are a voracious reader. Uh, what do you like to read? Well, I've got a, a set uh, uh, program. During the off season, I'll read anything that <clears throat> helps me keep my leadership <clears throat> um, uh, talents fresh. So I'll read a book about great leaders, biographies, <clears throat> leadership books, uh, always trying to keep the message fresh. Once spring training starts, and that's where you get, you know, a lot of the stress and the responsibility. When I have time to myself, you know, I want to relax and I read nothing but fiction. And, uh, you know, I like espionage. I got, you know, a bunch of writers that, you know, you know, mysteries. Uh, so I love to read. Uh, one of the best things my parents taught me, especially my mother. I started reading when I was a kid. And one reason I lasted this long uh, was that a lot of times road trips, you know, 33 years, they were, yeah, but my friend, a book was always my friend. I never felt like, you know, a, a trip was too long because I'd read till we got there. Okay, Tony, I want to switch to something that I know um, along with your family and baseball means in so much to you. And that is, Tony LaRusse's Animal Rescue Foundation, uh, which you and your wife Elaine founded many years ago. And as Bill mentioned in his introduction, is a world-class organization. Tell us a little bit about the history of ARF and how it came to be. Well, it should be called Elaine LaRusse's Animal Rescue Foundation. Uh, we got married. Uh, I, I, there's a long story, but I was raised without pets and she had a dog and a cat. And, and I realized how great companion animals are. Uh, she was very, very knowledgeable. We all have always had animals, but she really knew, you know, the euthanasia rate and some of the solutions like spay and neuter and what a nonprofit could do to help. So in Oakland, we, uh, we realized that in our neighborhood, because of this dramatic example where the cat ran on the field, we're playing the Yankees. Uh, that there, in our neighborhood, there were not, all the nonprofits were overwhelmed. So we started our people rescuing animals. We were actually ending our 30th year. We added the compliment, which is recognizing the value, the miracle of unconditional love we have and then animals rescuing people. So um, never did we think that it would become what it's become. You know, we have a 30,000 square foot facility in Walnut Creek. A lot of it has to do with the notoriety of being a manager. You get a lot of free publicity, meet a lot of entertainers. So we've had great support. Um, as I said, I walked into Jupiter and met Steve Parrish because of uh, your cardinal roots. So now uh, our latest example of a, the animals rescuing people is we have started a program nine years ago with PTSD veterans that uh, we, we pick uh, the legitimate ones from the A's and Martinez and, and um, Livermore. And we made them with a dog, you know, we match them with a dog. And one of our differences, we pay all the expenses uh, as a veterinarian and, and a program's gone in a beautiful way. And I think it's gonna be replicated around the country. So. Players always said that I work harder for Arthur than I do for them. And I said, I didn't know you were that smart because it's true. If you were as worthwhile as they are, 
<laughs> I'd work harder for you, but you are, so I don't. You know, Tony, I've talked to you about this in the past, but one of the incredible things that Bill Harmer and his board at the Westport Library and his leadership team have done is they, they revisioned the Westport Library, and it's really become a hub of the Westport uh, community in this part of Fairfield County, Connecticut. And one of the things that really impresses me about ARF is how you have done the same thing with ARF, that it is a hub in so many ways of the community. In addition to adoptions and pets and vets, there are summer camps and there are community events at ARF. And it is a really, uh, it's a place to go for people in Walnut Creek, California and the surrounding towns. And to me, it is, it is just a model for how a not-for-profit should be visioned and should be run. So you and Elaine have done just uh, incredible, incredible things. So thank, thank you. you. Um, I want to just, uh, we're about out of time. In fact, we're a little bit over time and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. And I started with a quote. So I'm going to end with one. And here, here's the quote. It says, over the years, I have marveled at LaRusse's passion for the game, his dogged pursuit of perfection, his commitment to his players, his endless quest to learn even more, his determination to win, his complete inability to accept defeat, even in spring training, and his breathtaking knowledge of the intricacies of baseball. That was written by your friend, John Grisham. Oh. And it was part of the foreword to your book, uh, One Last Strike, which is a phenomenal accounting of uh, the 2011 season and that incredible uh, historic World Series. Um, now I know that John Grisham is known for writing fiction but I would say that this time he was writing facts and uh, he got it right about you, except he didn't get it all about you. He left out a few things. He left out humorous, compassionate, giving, considerate, a great guy and a great friend. And so I thank you for being here. All of us in Westport are just thrilled as we can be that you were with us tonight and uh, wish we had more time. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. I think we covered a lot of them, but Tony, thanks and uh, all the best for 2021 in the White Sox. Well, I don't enjoy talking about myself, but I, I really enjoy talking about baseball. So thank you for the opportunity. And uh, if you want to do it again, I'm ready to do it. Thanks, Tony. Okay. Hi, it's, it's Alex from the library. I just uh, just popping on to at the end here to say thank you to both of you, Steve and Tony. This was fantastic. And I know I speak for everybody because I've gotten a ton of texts and emails. We could have just sat here and listened to you guys all night. So uh, this was so great uh, for everybody out there. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you want to check out ARF and make a donation, the link is in the chat. Um, and if you want to uh, see more Westport Library programs, I put a link in the chat to a program we have tomorrow night with the NFL Today's James Brown. We're talking Super Bowl. Oh, um, tell him I said hello. I definitely will. Please. Um, and then again, just uh, Steve, thank you for bringing this opportunity to us and just masterful with that conversation. You guys, that was great. And Tony, it, what an honor. Uh, it's just I don't know. This was one of those programs where I texted my dad and I said, Hey, uh, dad, I got Tony La Russa come to the library. And the first time ever he goes, send me that link. So <laughs> <laughs> again, guys, thank you both so much. And Tony, best of luck in Chicago. We'll be rooting for you. Thanks a lot. All right. All right, everybody be well, be safe and have a good night. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Alex. See you.